I warn you up front, the very beginning of it is going to be a little audience participation, so don't worry, I'm not going to run around and sit in the seat next to you or anything like that, the way they do at Great Lakes Theater. But there's going to be a little audience participation. I wanted to talk a little bit about us, the Master Gardeners, first. We are trained by Ohio State University. The information we give is research-based. We don't talk about what grandma taught us or what we learned in the local garden center from somebody who probably was never trained. It's something, you, if you're interested, you will, can hear about it, as Carol mentioned. Next month, you want to become a master gardener? We'd love to have you. Those are the addresses. Lake.osu.edu is the website. We live at 105 Main Street. And if you have questions that you, you need to ask, you can call uh, April through October on Tuesdays from 9 to 11, that telephone number. If you don't find Tuesdays convenient, then call anyway and leave a message and they'll get back to you within 48 hours. Fact sheets, a lot of good information at ohioline.osu.edu and that's our Lake County Facebook page. Lots of information and just fun stuff to find out about. I did want to mention, as long as we're onto computers, if you want to search anything, and one of the things you might want to search on after this class is what kinds of needs does your particular house plant have? I encourage you to go to your search engine, type in site, S-I-T-E, colon, E-D-U, a space, and then whatever you put in there, what you'll get back will be researched information from colleges and universities. It won't be just somebody's idea about the best way to take care of mother-in-law tongue or uh, African violets or orchids or whatever. So site colon edu and you'll get really good information. We're going to talk a little bit about what a house plant is and actually what it is not. And we're going to talk about how to take care of it and in all the ways that it needs, water, light, fertilizer, temperature, humidity, da 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 da. Okay? First, what is a house plant? Well, tell me some of your house plants. Come on. I said audience participation. Umbrella, umbrella plant. Umbrella plant. Peace lily. Peace lily. Peace lily. Night blooming circus. Fig. Fig. I heard. Night blooming circus. African violet. African violet. Pathos. Pathos. Spider plants. Spider plants. I have an orchid I'm trying to. <laughs> yeah, and orchids are actually house plants because there's no such thing as a house plant. Okay? <laughs> You've got plants in your house. That's how get, they get the name, house plant. But really, folks, they came from outside. They came from outside and they came from the warm tropics to mountaintops to deserts to ponds, you name it. They came from some other place to start with. They never were supposed to be in your house. That's one of the reasons it's hard to take care of them. All right? And what you're going to try and do is to emulate their natural environment in your home. Think about that. If it's from a desert region, it likes it hot. Do you have it really hot in your house? Probably not. Okay. If it likes it dry, maybe you're okay in the winter because it's pretty dry in your houses then. But, you know, come the rainy weather, it gets pretty humid. So, you know, depends on what they need. And I've got down there, beware of gift planters. Okay? Now, why do I say that? The florist who put it together thinks that those plants look nice together. They look very nice together. Okay? The African violet, the spider plant, maybe some ivy. Trouble is, 
they don't have the same requirements. African violets don't like their feet wet. You put a succulent in there and they hate their feet wet. They'll rot on you. So you really, they're beautiful, keep them for a while, but my recommendation would be to split them out and plant them in other pots so that you can continue to enjoy them. Now you can come up with a container that you can put those separate plants in and why not? But they have to be treated separately. Okay? We're not going to talk about all of these ex exhaustively, but holistic care is what you're after and it means to integrate all of the cultural factors necessary for that particular house plant. And they include the soil you use, the light, the humidity, etc. Even r rate of growth, because some things grow fast, other things grow slowly, and you're going to fertilize based on, in, in part, based on the growth rate. So, water. Okay, now it's, it's uh, audience participation again. Okay. When do you water your plants? When they need it. When they need it. Once a week. Once a week. It depends. It depends. Good answer. When I think the soil is dry. When you think it's dry. Okay. Well, that was the first question. Uh, Show of hands, how many do it just once a week? It's easier that way. Depends on what plant it is. That may, it does, but what I'm talking about people who just simply say, okay, it's Tuesday, it's time to water the plants. Okay? I saw quite a few hands go up. I used the little, you know, thing you put in the soil and test if they need it. Okay, well, that's good too. When they start to droop, anybody in here wait until. Yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. guess what, they're about halfway gone at that point. They start drooping, they're telling you, I'm in trouble, okay? And if they droop too many times before you take care of them, you're going to kill them. Okay. All right, and yeah, I love this one. Whenever I remember it, okay? And when the soil is dry is the best time to do it. Yes? No. Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Why? Because water is the number one houseplant killer. Seriously. Somebody gave me one of those planters. There was a, a spider plant in the middle. There were succulents in there. There was an ivy in there. There were some other things. Well, of course, I had to water it for the ivy and the spider plant, but I didn't need to water it for the succulents. They all rotted and died. Okay? So. And we do typically water too often, whether it's because, well, I'm going away, so I'm really going to drench them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But it always should be done on an as-needed basis. And one of the general recommendations is... If your potting soil is right for the plant, then you water it when the top one to two inches are dry. The roots are down in the bottom. They're not worrying about the roots at the top. The roots are in the bottom of the pot usually. So if the top is dry, then you know you're going to have to refresh the plant. Okay? But there are some that, and I finally learned, about succulents. Somebody in the back row taught me a lot about succulents. And I've just ignored them. And guess what? They're flourishing. They're flourishing. Yeah. I, I killed several before I found that out. But some need constantly moist. I bought a few orchids from an orchid grower in the western part of the state. And he, he, uh, most all of his orchids require uniformly moist soil, okay? So it, it really depends on the plant. There's two ways, you water top down or bottom up, okay? That's my bathtub, and those are my orchids, because they all need to be watered at, a, at the same time. They're all dry. 
I just put them all in my tub, I use the handheld, and I wash them down. Okay? The nice thing about it is they're going to drain, and they'll drain in the bathtub, and when they're fully drained, I put them back so that I can enjoy them outside. Sometimes I forget them and I just enjoy <laughs> going to my bathtub. And <laughs> Never mind. Okay. That was TMI. <laughs> Bottom up, you can put them in a bowl of water and let the roots draw up what they need. And don't let them sit there for a day or two. You know, until you feel the top of the soil is moist, then, then you can move on. But allow them to drain completely. Don't, do not set, leave them in that bowl of water and walk away and say, oh my god, I forgot to move them. It's been there for three days. Yeah, well, they're dead. You really need to know your plant and how much moisture it needs. This is why you need that site colon edu. So you put in spider plant, you put in succulents, you put in whatever plant you've got, and you can say water if you want. And it will come up and tell you how often that particular plant needs to be watered. You want to use room temperature water, not hot, not cold. Plants don't like to get their feet cold. As an aside, that's one of the reasons I have a real aversion to the ice cube orchids. But that's another talk. You want to try and get rid of the chlorine if you can. So just let it sit for a while. You know, fill your watering can up with water. Walk away, come back, water your plants. And don't use water softening systems. Uh, it's the, the minerals in those systems aren't good for plants. Okay, Light. Light is one of those things that plants need to make chlorophyll, which is their food. It's, it's, the process is called photosynthesis. And you, again, you need to know what your plant needs. Is it a sun lover? Does it need shade? Maybe during a certain time of the year, you want to have a lot of dark. Sometimes you want more light. Plants bloom if they're bloomers. They bloom best when they get the right amount of light. If they don't get the right amount of light, they'll, they'll stay nice and green and, and flourish for you, but you won't get any flowers. And you can determine how much light you're getting from a particular thing by simply holding a piece of white paper near the window or near the source of light, put your hand over it, and see what kind of shadow you produce. But you need to know before you do that what your plant needs. Okay. Also, if you've got some of the pathos or maybe even spider plants, some of them have variegated leaves. That means they've got less chlorophyll. Because wherever it's white or non-green, that's not chlorophyll. So it's, it's not able to make as much food. And so it will re require additional light rather than low light because of that whole photosynthesis thing. And you know, you've seen them. Your grant, your, especially if it's a light lover, it's going to grow to the light, you know? And so if you don't keep turning your plant, you're going to have kind of this lopsided thing that's just got stuff hanging over on this side. Yeah, you're, you're nodding because you've got those plants. I can see. <laughs> if you don't have enough light for your plant, if, you, if it's supposed to bloom, then move it. But don't move it every two or three days. Move it for a week or two or more. Wait until you see if there's any improvement. If there isn't, then move it to another location. But it's also always helpful to know up front how much light you need to begin with. And if you can't get it from your windows, some people don't have a lot of lovely southeast facing windows, then you can use artificial light. And some of the regular bulbs will actually give you the light you need, but you can buy special grow lights and just put them in your, use them in your regular lamps near your plant and it will give more, more light to the plant. So 
you've got too much light, so you've got your, your, your tips are curling up because they, they're shrinking away from the light. They're developing freckles, if you will. They begin to wilt because there's just too much light uh, for them, and they will actually fade. As an extreme example, when I first got married, my husband had a bunch of plants, and I said, oh, well, I know how to take care of plants. I wasn't a master gardener yet. I thought I did. So I just put all of his plants outside because it was a nice, we got married in June, it was a nice, you know. Yeah, well, I killed them. I didn't bother to take them into the shade first and then move them slowly out into the sun. I put them right out in the sun. My jade plant literally went white. Literally white. Yeah. I learned <laughs> too little light. Somebody here was talking about the leggy plants. That's because there isn't enough light so that they're, they're growing to get to the, the stretching to get to the light. If you start your plants for your garden and you don't have the light close enough to your little tomato plants and whatever, they will grow very spindly because they're trying to get to that light source that they need so much. You can also get bud drop and you'll get fluor fewer flowers because, as I said, flower development requires light. And your variegated plants might all of a sudden turn green on you. You thought they were pretty when they were all variegated, but guess what? They're all green because they don't have enough light. Why are they going all green if they don't get light? What, the, what are they getting for themselves? Yeah, they're, they're giving themselves more surface area for photosynthesis to occur and for them to have the chlorophyll. Yep. All right, that's a southeast facing window. The south is the most intense light, but you'll see that outside it's, it's kind of filtered. Those are my orchids. My orchids love that spot. They just adore it. But east and west facing, you get about two thirds the less light. So if you've got a plant that doesn't require a lot of light, then you can move them to one of those windows. North has about one fifth the amount of light that a south facing window has. Remember, it's east, south, west. North is over there. It's not getting much light. Right? And if you've got light walls in your, where your plants are, it's going to reflect the light. It's going to give you more light without, <laughs> without you having to work for it. Okay? If you've got dark walls, then it's going to absorb the light and it's, you're going to need more light to make up for the fact that you're losing it to the background, the dark walls. Okay, we talked a little bit about temperature. If your plant wants cool, then your house ought to be between 55 and 65. If your plants are kind of average, then pretty much what mine is like is going to be fine for it, 70, 65 to 70. If you got warm loving plants, you're going to have to crank that <laughs> thermostat up a bit, 70 to 80. Uh, most plants are going to like that 70 to 80. Well, you know, if it likes it, maybe 75. Mm -hmm. okay. And at nighttime, most plants really want it cooler. So if you're those kinds of folks like we are, where your nighttime temperatures are lower than your daytime, then your plants are going to be very, very happy because they're going to want that redu reduction. And flowering plants actually like it even cooler than your foliage plants. You all know this. You don't let them get a draft, whether it's from a heat vent or an air conditioning vent. Plants don't like drafts. They like air circulation, so you don't mush them together too much. They like air circulation, but they don't like drafts. So you don't have a fan playing on them. You have the fan over, circulating the air above the plants maybe, or whatever. But you don't have them in a draft. And flowering plants, plants are especially sensitive and they will drop their flowers. They will kind of fade a titch. They're very sensitive. 
And you don't want um, temperature extremes so that, of course, we've been having that lately, haven't we? Yeah, 85 one day and 50 the next. Yeah. Mm. Not good for plants. All right, humidity. You know what that is. It's how much moisture is in the air. Some plants really, really need the humidity. Other plants really don't. You need to know what your plant needs. Succulents really do not like a whole lot of extra moisture in the air. Orchids, on the other hand, love to have some moisture around them. African violets, as I said, don't like their feet wet, and they, so they don't want too much. But you've got to go online and you've got to find, because I, I don't know the, the needs of everybody's house plants. You've got to figure that out for yourself. Humidity. The upper two on the top, I think the one on the left is a Rex begonia. Uh, the one on the right is a prayer plant. They're high humidity flowers or plants. The low humidity, that's a, okay, a philodendron down on the bottom, uh, but those are the low humidity plants. So cactus and, and other cacti and other succulents prefer low humidity. So those are just some, some of the examples. If you want to add humidity or you need to add humidity, one of the ways to do it is get a saucer, put some stones in it, fill it with water. It'll go up and it'll humidify the plant. Down here is a planter stand that has places for the stones and you just have all your plants on there. You can cluster plants to encourage more humidity, but don't get them so close they don't get any air circulation. But the closer they are, the more humidity they maintain, they, they, they keep within them. Plants thrive in bathrooms and, and kitchens because there's lots of humidity in those rooms. And if you've got light that's coming in, you know, you've got a perfect place. I've got a window, a garden window in my kitchen which gets all the steam coming up from the kitchen sink and it gets light because it's sitting out there getting, and it's shaded by my ever-growing Rose of Sharon. So it's filtered light. It's not getting bombarded with hot, hot, okay? A cloche, you know what those are? Or a bell jar, it's something to sit over your plants. For some that really, really love humidity, you can keep the humidity around the plant all the time. Okay. Do not depend on misting your plants. You'd have to stand there with the mister all day long to give them, and it doesn't make sense, really, when you think, well, it's just got the pebbles on the bottom with the, because that's evaporation and it's constant, okay? Misting, yeah, you get your leaves wet, which is not always a good thing, and and then it just goes away. It evaporates, and so you're not getting the benefits of the humidity when you're misting. So it's not recommended that you go that way. All right, fertilization. Oh, really sensitive topic. Pant in terms of sensitive topic, yes. First off, that's a general thing at the bottom, but just in general anyway, half the amount that the label says for fertilizing. If it says a teaspoon, use a half teaspoon. And if it's an orchid, one of the orchid growers I know says weekly, weekly for orchids. All right, but think about it in terms of the type of plant you have. If you've got a slow-growing plant, it needs less fertilizer. If it's a fast-growing plant, it's going to need more. Why? Because it needs the nutrients that you're giving it if it wants to grow more. Okay? If it's not growing at all, you're wasting it and possibly hurting your plant if you're giving too much fertilizer. If it's a newly planted plant, 
you've just repotted it or something, you really don't want to fertilize it very often because the roots need to develop so that they can actually take advantage of the fertilizer. So less often for a new planted, older plants are going to need it more often because they're older. They need vitamins like us folks that are older need vitamins. Okay, if you want it to grow more than it has been, then you want to fertilize it more often. But that's, you really still need to know what your plant wants. If it's the growing season, like I said, half recommended strength, every two weeks from March to September, according to my orchid grower, that's not for orchids. Orchids is weekly, weekly. <laughs> And you don't really want to fertilize during the winter months. Why not? They're, some of them are dormant. Yeah. They aren't growing in the winter time. So you don't want to fertilize them if they're not growing. Like I said, new plants really shouldn't be fertilized too often in the beginning because their roots need to develop in order for them to take up the nutrients. One size does not fit all. In some things, most things. So you really need to use a house plant fertilizer and maybe even a particular type of fertilizer for the particular type of plant. Succulents would need something other than your other uh, house plants. Orchids would need something other than. There are two types of fertilizers I use for my orchids. When I want to encourage them to bloom, I've got one, and I do that once a month. And when it's just regular, I, it's, it's the regular orchid fertilizer. The best ones have a one to two to one ratio. How many of you know what those numbers mean? Okay, a fertilizer contains three things, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Nitrogen is for green things. It's what you put on your lawn. Okay? Phosphorus is for flowering. And the potassium is for roots. And those are just very general, and there's crossover and all sorts of things. But that's in general. So what that tells me, if it's a 1 to 1 ratio, is that potassium and nitrogen are one half the amount of the phosphorus. There's twice as much phosphorus in there. For the, so that's pretty much going to be full, more often for a flowering plant than for other plants. You want to maintain your plant. You don't want to necessarily have fast growth. What happens if you have fast growth? Spindly. They're going to be spindly. They're going to be stretched out. You, only want to keep them happy. You don't want to get a growth spurt. If you give nitrogen to a plant, it's going to encourage fast green growth. That's why we put it on lawns. If you've got good cultural conditions, what does that mean? Well, you've got good air circulation. You're watering them appropriately. You've got the humidity it needs. You've got the heat it needs or the coolness, whatever you probably won't get diseases. On the other hand, if you don't have those nice conditions, then you could end up with some problems. Those poor growing conditions are going to stress your plant and make it a host for some diseases. So overwatering will bring about root rot. It will bring about other kinds of problems, um, maybe fungus. Poor soil conditions, you really need to repot your plants to give them fresh growing medium, not like every day, <laughs> every week, once a year, once every two years, whatever. Humidity levels, if it's too humid, you're going to encourage diseases if it's not. Um, it, so too much humidity is worse than not, not enough. And poor air circulation, you do have to, and that, again, you don't do it so that you got the plant in a in a draft. You're going to get root, crown, or stem rot because of either or 
wet conditions or cold conditions, if it's too cold for your plants. You can remove the diseased parts if there aren't that many of them. If, they're, if it's pretty much gone, then see if you can find a healthy leaf or something and create a new plant. And that's easy. You buy a little root tone, take that leaf from your African violet, stick it in the root tone, and stick it in the dirt, and you'll get a new African violet, ultimately. Leaf spots are uh, either fungi, bacteria, or the growing conditions. Again, uh, if you have good growing conditions, you won't get this. If you know your plant is infected and you really love it and you want it to stay happy, but you want your other plants to be happy too, take it away, put it in the corner, isolate it away from all the others until it's better. And if it doesn't get better, then take that leaf, make a new one. There, and there are chemical treatments. I'm not going to get into those today. All right, pests. There can be insects and mites, and there can be scale and aphids and all sorts of ugly things. There's the scale. That's, I believe, white fly. That's a mealybug. That's aphids. You sometimes get those, we were I was talking to someone early in the, uh, before the class started, that when you put plants out over the summer, you have to be careful when you bring them in that you're not bringing the bugs in with you. There are uh, systemic things that you can put on before you bring them in that will kill off whatever bugs you may have brought in. I have a divil of a time with rosemary. Don't know why, it grows beautifully outside. I do everything I'm supposed to do. I bring it inside, it is completely covered with um, the webs from the spider mites. Like, come on, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. Still doesn't work. You can use insecticidal soaps, get them in any place that sells plants and, and stuff. The scale, on the other hand, you've got to get it before it hits the adult stage. Scale has a hard set shell to it, and so you can't get through that shell to get rid of it. You can literally hand pick them off, and it's not that hard to do. I don't know where it came from, but I had it on one of my orchids. I have a feeling I got it from the place I bought the orchid. But I just flicked those stupid scales off and then I sprayed it and I made sure that it was okay and it was fine. But you have to get it, get the scale when it's still in the infant stage. Syringing, you know what syringing means? Okay, you're going to spray the plant to get rid of those. It works beautifully with aphids. Just wash them off. So. And typically, I would suggest that you take it outside and do it rather than um, if it's horribly infected, then you might have to get rid of the plant if you can't get rid of it. All right, you just bought a new plant. Think about it. Where did that plant come from? Well, outside initially, but where did it come from? before it got to the place you're going to buy it? A nursery, yeah. What are the growing conditions in a nursery? Optimum. Absolutely fantastically optimum. Otherwise, they wouldn't have good plants to sell you. So they've got absolute perfect sunlight. Not sunlight, but light. They're watered perfectly. Everything's perfect then you bring it home. Uh, is your place perfect? Probably not. The recommendation of OSU at this point is you want to have a lot of light the first couple of weeks that the plant is in your house because it's had the optimum amount of light. Then you're going to wean it away from that optimum amount because you don't want it really in that window. You want it over here by this window, but you have to have it in, in the really heavy light window to start with and then move it. You're just 
acclimatizing it to your home. Okay? So you start in a highlight area, and then you're going to gradually move it. Take four to eight weeks, two to three weeks, whatever you think. You can tell. Your plant's going to tell you, I'm liking this. This is working for me. Okay? The best time to buy them, believe it or not, is spring through autumn. You really don't want to buy new plants in winter unless, of course, it's a Christmas cactus or a poinsettia. You might want to buy those in the winter time. And it's because the, you, you want that plant, remember, it's coming from an optimum location. It's coming from that nursery where it likes what it's been given. You move it into your home in winter, there are low light levels in winter time everywhere. And in your house even more so because you've got those walls that, and only some windows. The younger the plant, the better. Don't go for the big showy ones. They'll become big and showy when you, get a ch when you had them for a while. But also remember, when you're buying them, if you buy them in the wintertime, don't just take that poinsettia and, you know, oh, I won't be outside that long and just scoot it into your car because it gets cold and it gets cold fast. So cover it. Even if you buy cut flowers in the winter, you should cover them so that they don't get hit with stiff cold. And plants just don't like, plants don't grow under 50 degrees. They also don't grow over 90 degrees. They just don't like it. In the summertime, you know, I did this once. I can't believe I did it. <laughs> I bought an absolutely gorgeous orchid. It was, it was a master gardener trip, too. And I bought this orchid, and I put it in the car, and we stopped for lunch. I wasn't happy when I got back to the car. Mm -hmm. I wasn't happy at all. One half of it completely died. But I had two fronds. I got one frond. So you don't keep them in hot cars with the sun beating down. Don't do it. That's a pretty much pot-bound orchid, folks. <laughs> That's a real, yeah. It's been repotted, don't worry. <laughs> You can see it's got lots of new growth over here. And so it's just being crowded out by all of these no longer viable. You, you want to repot when, when it's got pot bound. <laughs> I should have done it before it got this bad. The soil also is going to get tired. Even if the plant isn't pot bound, the soil needs to be refreshed. Okay. No matter how well you try and get rid of the calcium and other things in your water when you water your plants, fertilizers and other things will leave uh, salt deposits. And so you want to get rid of those. And maybe you just don't like that particular container. You know, I've changed the way, you know, the colors in my living room. And that container just doesn't match. So I want to repot. Yeah, there are lots of reasons. You really want to do it in the spring before it starts growing. You want to wait if your plant has gone into bloom. I've got one at home. I know it needs to be, or it's an, another orchid. It needs to be repotted, but it's already started to produce its buds. I'm not going to touch that sucker until it's through blooming, and then I will repot it. Don't go from here to here. Go from here to here, two inches maximum. If it's a very small pot to start with, you don't go two inches, you might go one inch. You want, the, the plant doesn't want a whole lot of room because then it feels it's got to put out roots. If it's putting out roots, it's not doing anything up top. It's not doing flowers. It's not doing anything else. It's concentrating on filling up that pot with roots. Do you want roots? Well, yeah, you need roots. But you don't want all of the plant's energy going to producing roots. 
So you make sure your pot sorry, is not too much bigger than the old one. And always have a drainage hole. I had somebody bring me a plant and said, my, my orchid isn't doing very well. Well, I looked at the pot. One, it didn't have a drainage hole in it. I pulled the plant out of it. It was dripping wet, and all of the roots had just simply turned to mush. Okay? That you can try that, but I don't recommend it because you can't get inside the pot <laughs> and you can't figure out if the water has because the roots are going to grow into that that area as well. I mean, roots aren't going to say, "Oh, that's stone. I, I'm not going to touch that." You know, it's just going to keep growing and it's going to get in the water. So you really should not plant plants in non-drainage pots. All right. There are so many different kinds of potting things, soil out there. Uh, one of our master gardeners mixes her own. And, but you can buy special stuff for cacti. You can do special stuff for orchids. You can do special stuff for just plain old potting soil, African violets, whatever. And they are designed to have the kinds of drainage that those plants need. But again, if you've got a good sterile potting mix that's got enough porousness to it to keep the moisture but not hold the moisture, then that'll, that's all right. Um, you, if you've got a drainage hole, a lot of people say, well, I don't want a drainage hole because the dirt's just going to run out of it. And you know what those old dryer sheets are for? Don't throw them away. No. Take the old dryer sheets, put them at the bottom of your pot, and it keeps the dirt in the pot. It doesn't. Where's it going to go? It's not going to go through the. So it's a, it's an easy way to keep it out of the landfill too. You know, those things. You can use coffee filters, but they've got to be new ones. So. You know, unless you feel like really washing your, I don't want to do that. So, um, but dryer sheets work. Um, if you've got a pot, a, 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 a pot-bound one like the one I showed you, you really need to loosen up the the roots so that they can start breathing and growing again. So, but you really shouldn't wait that long. I shouldn't have waited that long. And you maintain the the soil level. It just, you know, it means don't bury it any deeper than it was before and don't bury it any higher than it was before. You want to keep the crown at the same place it was in the old pot. Okay? But you want to have enough room to water. So one and a half to two inches so that the, when you do decide, because you've checked the one to two inches, it's dry, it's time to water, uh, you want to be able to put the water in there to, to do it. So, in, in summary, not all plants are the same, so you can't treat them as though they're the same. You do need to know what their needs are, and the only way to do it is to do a little research on your part. Yeah, and, and water when they need it, not, not when it's convenient for you, uh, because we want them to grow. <laughs> and you repot when you need, and acclimatize new plants, so enjoy. That's those are my references if you need them. And a lot of the material came from the material I learned from when I was taking the Master Gardener class. And so, questions? Oh, oh. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Woo. Yes. OK, I have a water softener system. If I get water, would it better be distilled water or spring water if I buy, you know? Uh, so all the water in your house is softened? Yeah. OK, then it uh, doesn't matter. Spring or, or distilled doesn't matter. Yes? You, uh, say someone's going to go on a vacation for a long time, and they have plants that's going to be, and they don't have anybody to come in. Uh, what do you recommend? Some of these little things that you can put water in and it slowly releases, what do you recommend for someone that's going to be on vacation for a while, but the plants need to be watered while they're gone? Find better friends. 
Uh, no, I, I, I. Sometimes you see these little. I, I do, water Yeah, I know, and yeah. you really because not all plants are going to like that, right. Dave, and so you could end up having some of them dead anyway because they've been overwatered. If you've got a lot of succulents, leave them. Leave them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Just leave them. They're going to be fine. They're they're not going to be unhappy. Some require maybe more moisture, or maybe drought. Yeah. So it, it's really hard to give you a, a single definitive right. answer. But succulents can stay. Um, your orchids, you've got to find a friend who'll take care of them. Seriously, you can't do without that. Um, African violets, same thing. Any of the the ones that have really special needs, um, you, you know, yeah, just get some better friends. That's all. <laughs> yes. We just learned this from a friend using tobacco juice. She makes tobacco juice and puts it in. Yes. Never heard of it. And, and since I haven't heard of it, I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't have learned it through OSC. Yeah. Now, uh, I. Um, yeah, that's kind of like Grandma taught me. And so, therefore. Um, <laughs> OSU doesn't let me do that. <laughs> so, yes. Similar to that, what about using used coffee grounds to dust onto your soil? Actually, coffee grounds are great in compost piles. But they're too strong for like directly to your... I, I would prefer that they be broken down. Yeah. But, I mean, you, you go to uh, Starbucks and typically you can get their grounds and I, I collect them every once in a while and I put them in my compost pile because it makes really good compost. Yes? Some of the are acidic, so you have to be careful because some plants don't like acidic. Yeah. So you have to be careful with that. No, I, I wouldn't, I, I, if push comes to shove, if somebody needs an answer to any of those questions, my answer is no. <laughs> because, no, because I have not been taught that by OSU, and I can teach what I've been taught. Um, you can, but you can, if you're interested, cite colon edu space coffee grounds houseplants. Do the research. If you're doing an EDU site, then you're going to get research-based information. But yeah, coffee grounds in a compost pile, perfect. Tea bags, perfect. Around my plants, uh, not so much. I have plants that I plant this summer that die in the end of the season. I reuse that dirt for the next year. Is that OK? You have to dump every bit of it out. Yeah, yeah. You want, you don't know what's left in there, especially if your plants have died. <laughs> it's kind of, mm, I don't know. But no, you always start with fresh, fresh soil, always. So what would you do with the soil? You put it in compost? Put it in compost, sure. It, oh, it's, uh, if you're, that's a whole other talk I do. But, um, no, with compost, um, every once in a while you want to inoculate it with soil. And so that's a perfect place to put it. Just, just shove it in there um, with everything, with, with the coffee grounds. <laughs> yes? If you're overwintering, like I have a couple of flowering plants that I put on my back porch, um, it's, you know, sometimes freezing, but before I put them out uh, on the back porch, should I put this in stomach? Uh, before you, uh, uh, they're, oh, they're coming in from outside and you're overwintering them on your back porch. Okay, yes, I would give the, it a shot of the systemic. Um, the, the last watering, I would water with the systemic and that would keep down the possibility of you having brought the, the bugs in with you. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, if you don't see signs of 
infestation. I wouldn't worry about spraying. The, the systemic should do it for you because it goes throughout the plant and goes and, and, and protects it that way. Doesn't that take a while to work the systemic? No, no it, it actually, it's, the nice thing about systemics is that it stays in the plant and so it's pr continuous protection. It's not just a one-shot deal. It, the systemic is there. Uh, for example, I put it around my roses um, so that I um, try and keep the black spot away. Um, and I know it's good for two to three months, and I don't have to worry about it again. That's what a systemic does. So, so when you're over wearing something, how often should you want it? Because I had a lantana that I bought in, and it did real well. I'm bad about watering, so I have to put it in my calendar. And it did well until I forgot to water it. It just died. Yeah. No, you, you, it really depends on the plant. And so you keep it comfortably moist, but not overly. Uh, I, the watering needs in winter when it's coolish. Remember, they're not growing, especially if they're in less than 50 degree temperature. They're not growing. So they need water just to maintain their life level. So um, I would d go half or th a third of the time usually. But you, yeah, you don't leave them um, dry out completely. Okay? I can never get orphans to last. Mm. They're flower dyes. I put two ice cubes instead of them. Mm. 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 No. <laughs> orchids don't like to get their feet cold. And so by putting ice cubes on there, you're keeping their feet cold. I, yeah, I know, I know. However, that's a whole nother talk. Seriously, it is. Uh, um, orchids, the, the orchids that, uh, it's getting in a whole, uh, back up. Don't try and answer everything, Susan. Um, If your orchid has stopped blooming, it does not mean it's dead or dying. It's just through blooming. Look at the, the stalk. If the stalk stays green, leave it there. It might actually put out more blooms. If it turns brown, then cut it off and just take care of it the way you have been taking care of it. And when it has recuperated from its last bloom, it will bloom again. Now, if the leaves start to fall off and everything, then you know all bets are off. The plant is dead. But you can rebloom those orchids. They don't want you to, the people who make them, because they want you to buy another one when this one stops blooming. But just because they stop blooming doesn't mean it's dead. And most healthy orchids are kind of pretty with just those beautiful shiny green leaves, you know? And so you just cut off the, st but it will, if, if that, if that uh, bloom stalk is still green, it could potentially put out new blooms and it could actually put out baby orchids. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen them, but they're called kikis and they, instead of a flower, you get a new orchid plant and the little roots start coming out and you wait until it's really big enough and you cut it off and plant it and you got a whole new plant. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Uh, you mentioned about rosemary, bringing your rosemary in. Yeah. What about basil? Did you bring basil on the side? Um, yeah. uh, I would take a cutting and do it that way. I wouldn't try because they tend to go, they, they, they um, get, blo as soon as they start blossoming, um, you're, you lost your basil. It doesn't taste as good. Okay, one more. When you're repotting, like a basic potting soil, like the basic potting soil, that's good for most. Most, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if it's an orchid or a succulent or something like that, you might want to get the more particular one. Okay, I'm done.